pleasure. Where do, where do we find you today? Are you in your home office or a studio or wh whereabouts? Yeah, well, it's a little bit of both. It is my home office and studio. Okay, right. And so you actually do, you do some recording there as well? Yeah, I got all my, my instruments right here, actually, uh, just always ready to um, pick up and attack and, and perform and play. So I got a microphone here, but this is also my home office as well. Right. So do you um, just have your instruments handy like that? Does that mean that you will frequently just grab one and start playing if you're if you're looking for inspiration or if you're just trying to think about something else do you sometimes use music as uh, to fire up another side of your brain yeah absolutely it's it's really nice to take breaks during the day and just maybe play a melody or if i'm hearing a song to play along to it and um yeah it, ke it keeps the creative juices flowing but you know uh, just another side of what I do is music supervision and trumpet performance. So uh, they don't necessarily intertwine with each other at all, but at the same time, you know, they're both creative outlets involving music. So that's what I have a lot of fun with. Right, and that music supervision, uh, we just had Witchings in the comments comment about your movie posters behind you, uh, yeah. which you're involved with, which is incredible. Uh, thanks, yeah. So. Behind me is Till Death with Megan Fox. That was released last year. Uh, it's actually on Netflix now if you wanna, if anyone wants to check it out that's watching. And then uh, we have Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. That's currently on HBO Max. And then uh, I think La La Land's on HBO Max as well right now. But um, I worked on the soundtrack for that film and uh, just a couple posters to have as a nice Zoom background. Uh, <laughs> um, and so, you know. How satisfying is it? To, because so much work goes into all of those films and all of those productions. How satisfying is it to see the finished product and the music which you have helped place in there or even contributed to play their part in helping tell that director's story? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, it's a really great feeling. A lot of people don't realize that sometimes these projects take two to three years to come together from the script phase to principal photography to having the product finally released and especially with COVID a lot of we were sitting on a lot of films they were already finished it was just about finding the right distribution window to have it injected into the world and um, with films like this we have a composer we had Walter Mayer for Till Death and he did a fantastic job of creating the sound the thriller uh, you know landscape for the film the tonality of it all and then my job is to really find music that makes sense where it's it's pre-existing music to be used in the film so one song that i'm particularly proud of was called falling leaves by the asylum and it, it was like a scene that you always want as a music supervisor you uh, Megan Fox, her character is in a room and she takes uh, a vinyl and puts, or sorry, she doesn't take the vinyl, but she takes the needle for the player and puts it on a vinyl that's there. And then this song starts to play. And then this whole other scene erupts with that song playing. So I found this song and it was an authentic 1967 song. And I went back and forth with the director because he wanted another type of song that everyone knows and the thing is, I reached out for a quote on that song and it was too expensive. So then I had to start reaching out to all my contacts to find something of a similar vibe, a similar emotion. But one of the great things about it is, is it was a B-side track, relatively unknown, but still authentic, got the job done, and it, it enhanced the scene. Uh, and it was also this big building moment and sometimes when you put a, drop a song in a scene and everyone knows what it already is, people are gonna know how the rest of it, yeah, uh, as Joe says, it was a literal needle drop. Um, people usually know how the rest of the scene's gonna play out. Like if you hear, I'm a Barbie girl, you know the rest of the scene is gonna, what it's gonna be, right? It's gonna be like uplifting, funny, hopefully, it could be a horror scene, who knows? But right. with this song, no one knew what was coming or how the song was going to play out because they're not familiar with it. So in terms of a thriller film, 
you kind of want that because you want people unsuspecting, not knowing. And if the music could play and interject and help be a part of that, it's a win-win for everyone. And so little moments like that really excite me. And that's when the director turns to me and I'm able to pull my resources and dive into some music that I've never you know, heard of before or explored and make new relationships with different publishers and different labels. Uh, and it's exciting. And then it all of a sudden comes together and then it's released and then you get uh, reviews, you get people talking about it. And it's, it's fun. It's a cultural thing because everyone owns a smartphone now pretty much and uh, they can digest this content quickly, which is also really fun. You don't have to go to the movie theater necessarily anymore to get the exclusive on things. And so the past couple of years has really shaken up a lot of distribution, how, how films are being digested into the market. But one thing remains consistent, and that's that people always want content and they want good music with it. Right. How do you even, I mean, you've literally got a universe full of music at your disposal, presumably. Yeah. So when, when you're tasked with a scene like that one you described in Megan's film, um, where do you start? Where do you start going, oh, I think this song could be right for that, or I think this song could be right for that? Are, are you pitched songs, or do you just have to use your musical knowledge? Yeah, uh, it's a little bit of both. So I wish I had the, uh, you know, wavelengths of my brain to comprehend all different types of music, but I'm not that good, right? So I really do rely on publishers and different libraries to send me music, and they're sending me music all the time. I get sent hundreds of hundreds of songs every week. And what I do is I might not be able to listen to them all, but I save all of them in a folder of mine, not necessarily the music files, but the keywords in each email blast that gets sent out. So uh, a, a lot of publishers are really great on making curated lists. They'll say, okay, authentic 60s and 70s music, or it'll be another playlist of the latest jazz or world music and all these other different tags on it. And that way, at least I'll have a little database where I could pull music from or start somewhere. And it's really great because a lot of these publishers specialize in certain types of music. So I will go and do a search find it, listen to it, make a list. And then I use a product called Disco, which organizes a ton of my music and uh, allows me to share it with the director. So that way I could create a short list and then they could go through it and say, I like this, I like this, I don't like this. This is kind of along the lines of what I want and right. go from there. But you know, the technology and the sharing of music uh, has continually gotten better. And I, a lot of it has to do with metadata the prop properly tagging your music uh, and, and getting it into the right hands. And I, you know, I do get pitched a lot of music as well from independent artists and that's really hard to, you know, process and, and to respond to a lot of music supervisors have a unsolicitation policy where they, they won't accept anything unsolicited. Um, I'm the same way. And, you know, I need that referral. I need to know that you're an accredited, a company in order to work with you because if there's one sample or if there's something wrong uh it goes on my shoulders and i can't risk that you know there's million hundreds of millions of songs in the universe and so um really going to a place that um, is accredited and will you know make sure that the license goes through at the end is really important otherwise it holds everything up you can't have things in there that's not licensed properly yeah. So for an independent artist who's watching this, they might, your advice to them in terms of getting their music uh, on um, soundtracks or used in films is to find a publisher. Is that, would that be the, the, the best advice? Yeah, that or, you know, every, everyone's music has a certain genre and there's certain, as I was saying earlier, there's certain libraries and publishers and sync managers who specialize. Sorry, I have a, a little doggy with me who I'll bring. Hey, Fergie. Stop it. <laughs> Hollywood. Music industry never sleeps, right? Um, so uh, you, you have to, my, my best advice would be to approach, um, first of all, build a sizable catalog. Because what happens to me all the time is someone will send me a song and be like, I just made this. And it's like, okay, you made one song, you know? Um, the people that are at the top 1% of the sync game are pumping out 
10 songs a day and knowing uh, knowing the right lingo and the right things to do they might not even be interfacing directly with the music supervisor they depend on their sync agent to do that so it's really about amassing a catalog and then bringing it to someone and say hey this is what i do this is what i specialize in they could feel the authenticity in it they could understand it and then they might start um entering in the license agreement with you to to find those sync placements and they'll specialize in having all the contacts with all the music supervisors and people who are the buyers um and so a lot of times independent artists feel the need to take that upon themselves and it's a really tough road to go up upon you know don't my biggest advice would don't be finding sync as your main source of income only very few people do that and they're really really good at it so you kind of have to diversify your portfolio as well if you, right. if you for that game okay we, we had a request in the comments to see the puppy okay hey Fergie, <laughs> come here come here Don't be shy. Come on, come here. Okay, here she is. <laughs> Aww, cute. Her, can you say hello to the world? Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> now, start coming in. <laughs> well, as soon as we show the doggy. Yes, he'll be right here. That's it. Look, I mean, we come straight into the music supervision part of your professional life. But of course, horn playing and trumpet playing is such a big aspect of your professional life as well. And I'd, I'd love to go back to even your introduction into playing the trumpet and, and playing horns. Was that, was that your first, uh, look, the, the comments are going nuts since we've seen. <laughs> Steals the show or one more time, if she doesn't get annoyed. Hi, Ruggy, Ruggy. <laughs> So in terms of your um, trumpet playing, was that your first instrument? Uh, actually, my first instrument was the piano. Mm. And uh, I kind of started to learn about music theory through that and getting accustomed to tones and chords and things like that. And then it was in fifth grade where I was in public school and they laid all the instruments out for me. Oh, and late July, I just said Ryan's the best trumpet player. Thank you so much. We actually met through a service called Sound Better, and I've added horns to a bunch of her tracks. So that's been a lot of fun, a side thing that I do. But um, yeah, and I thought the trumpet was the easiest instrument because it only has three valves. You know, you're like, how hard could it be? <laughs> really, there's you have to worry about your embouchure. Um, it's really tough to miss a lot of notes. It's not, it's inconsistent. You can't really, you know, the trumpet's different um, temperatures all the time. It gets really cold because it's a brass instrument. So a little all over the place there. But um, yeah, I went down the road. I wanted to quit a bunch of times, but my parents kept saying, no, you got to keep playing and keep practicing. And um, it evolved from sounding like an elephant dying to eventually something that resembled a good you know tone and then it went from there so that's that's when it started but um i i played trumpet all throughout college and that's when i ultimately realized i didn't want to be a full-time trumpet player i wanted oh. to pivot to be behind the scenes in the industry and so that's when that started why why, why not a full-time trumpet player yeah, uh, well, especially being in LA, you're in one of the most competitive markets. I, I went to UCLA and the trumpet studio was extremely competitive and I saw the level of um, professionalism and just how they could transcribe music so easily when looking at a sheet music and um, they were so advanced. And I started to realize if I really wanted to be a classical player, it would be really tough to um, get to that level and win an audition because hundreds of people audition for these pieces or, or for these positions in an orchestra and they open up once every 10, 15 years. So the odds of actually landing it are really, really tough. And um, uh, yeah, I was looking at just at the analysis of would I actually enjoy that as well because you're playing other people's music all the time. Um, you, It's pretty scary to be on stage and wait a hundred bars and then have to hit a note perfectly. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then also the state of certain orchestras were um, 
kind of tough um, in terms of funding and longevity. Uh, we've seen certain metropolitan orchestras, unfortunately, have to go away. So I was looking at that from afar as well, because it's like classical music, as of recent, has had to kind of redefine and re-engage with their audiences. So a lot of them are doing film to uh, uh, orchestra to picture. So they'll have an orchestra on stage while showing Star Wars or The Godfather or Harry Potter. And that really brings in a huge audience. Um, because, you know, it's like, I, I survey my friends, I'd say maybe 5% of them listen to classical music. Um, and of that, how many actually go to the shows of classical music? So I love it. I'm a big proponent of it, but I'll, I'll always support it. But for me to be a player in it, I wanted to take a different route. Right. And, and was classical music, is that where, were you more interested in that from a trumpet perspective? Or were you also interested in pop music and what was happening in the charts at the time that you were learning? Yeah, it was, um, you know, a little bit, uh, sorry, I just totally blanked on the question. Can you say it one more time? Yeah, yeah. so I was asking you, you were mentioning the classical music, um, I guess p performing as part of an orchestra with the trumpet, um, but you know, you've got such an incredible resume now working with a lot of top pop artists these days. Were you also interested back then in how trumpet would fit into popular music or was it? Very yeah, I, the ball started to roll then because I was hearing a lot of popular songs, but they weren't using live elements of trumpet. So that is when I started to think, how can I be a part of that and get in these sessions? You know, um, you look at some really big trumpet players like Jerry Hay, who, who orchestrated all the trumpet lines for Michael Jackson's Thriller and stuff like that. And I thought, how can I start to do that? And and. I've always been a huge fan of Dave Matthews Band. They're the reason why I, like the, the main goal throughout college was to play trumpet with them. And then they ended up getting a trumpet player, but it was still my dream to join them on stage. And it still is to this day, but I, I started chasing that as a dream. And they used a lot of grassroots marketing and they used their resources from Charlottesville, Virginia in front of them to form their band. So I was like, I'm in LA, all these great artists are around me. I need to start forming my inner circle of people who will, you know, give me this, op give me these opportunities. And what I started to do was I started to reach out to studios and I quickly found out that that was the wrong way to go because studios just book the sessions. They don't necessarily have a say in who uh, is the players for them. So then I started reaching out to management companies that represented some artists who I thought could use horns and they I didn't really have a resume of horn stuff so they didn't want to put me in front of their clients and have me be a bus right and so then I started reaching out to artists directly through social media dms everything and then that's when I started to get some traction and then I started meeting with producers and formulating relationships with them and it's all about your, the hang and being able to make music and working efficiently and knowing that when you show up, you could do cool things with the trumpet. So I had to learn how to layer myself so I could, you know, efficiently play over and, and have a bigger sound to improvise, to be able to hear what they're articulating and translate it into horns so that it makes sense for the song. And so that was quite the process over five years. I, I started off playing in people's like bathrooms, right. studios to some of the worst setups and meeting with some people that I didn't vibe with at all, but it was all part of the journey to eventually meet some more credible people who uh, have really grown in the past couple of years to be like megastar producers and, and now what I like to call cl uh, close friends. Um, and so, I've been doing on the music supervision side as well. It's really great because I hear the latest music that they're making and I could keep it in mind and think, oh, well, this would be really great for this or that or this. So it's it's kind of like a playful relationship in the sense that we, we both benefit from knowing each other. Yeah, nice. When was your, when do you feel like you got your first foot in the proper door? Where When you think about all those years of sessions, which were, a little bit sketchy. When was the when was the credit where you thought, right, this is I've moved up now and, and this could start something? 
Yeah, well, it was actually, um, it was funny because you guys posted us the story today promoting uh, our interview and it was using Fall in Line by Christina Aguilera and Demi Lovato. And that happened, it was a funny story. Um, I posted a video of myself on Twitter playing to this John Bellion song. And then I got a DM from the, uh, their produce, his producing team, which is known as OG Volta. And they said, where were you when we were making the album? And I'm like, I, I, I'm right here. And they said, like, let's link up. So we met up and uh, we really hit it off and uh, stayed in touch. And then one day uh, they hit me up and said, hey, we have this song, can you drop by? And I dropped by. And I'm listening to it. I was like, oh, yeah, that's Christina Aguilera. And then I was in this session for about four hours. And Mark, um, who's one half of OG Volta, really work. He works me really hard whenever we're in the studio. He's just like take after take, playing high notes all over the place. Like my lips are dead. Um, <laughs> but he's a perfectionist. And he he really understands horns and the value that they add to these popular songs. And so I, I recorded a bunch. And then, you know, three months later, it turns out Demi Lovato's the featured artist on it. And Christina's releasing it as one of her lead singles from from her album, Liberation. So that's just how that came together. And it all started with me posting a video on Twitter, you know? And so, and then OG Volta has grown over the years and they just came out, uh, they just won two Grammys for their work with Donda. And um, I was lucky enough to play trumpet on a track on Donda 2, uh, which has not dropped yet, but it's available on the um, the Kanye, the STEM player. So, you know, it's just like formulating relationships like that are all around you. And my, the mistake I made when I first started was I was reaching out to the top all the time, but there's a ton of people who will grow around you and, if you, you know, formulate friendships with and plant that seed, hopefully it'll have a nice return later on. And um, it's and that's exactly what happened with the Dave Matthews band. You know, they did a lot of grassroots marketing. They started, made really name for themselves in Virginia and then started to, you know, get more notoriety and, and grow. And you, it's just, it's a slow burn. That's the other thing, you know, that's taken me six years to get some of these credits under my name. and. I'm really, really thankful for a company like JAXA to, how, to, to realize how important it is to showcase these credits, to have them properly labeled, and to be able to build a profile so that I could send it to a producer now and they could immediately look at it and know that like, okay, it's verified and they're credible and they can listen to snippets of my work. And so that's extremely valuable and I really appreciate it. Oh, that's great. We we appreciate your support, Ryan. Thank you very much. Sure. Oh, so when you go into a session and it's for uh, a Kanye album or Christina Aguilera or Lil Nas X, um, how much is what you play made up on the spot? How much does the producer say this is what we're after? How much like what's the how does that whole process work in terms of you? Making up what you would like to play? Or are you told this is what we would like you to play? How does that work? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And it the quick answer is it varies in every session. Uh, you have sur some producers who are adamant about what they have. They already have a part written. Others say, I just hear horns on this and I don't really know. Um, for the Lil Nas X, that was already recorded. Um, Nick Lee made all the horn lines, a fantastic trombone player who I believe is doing a, a right. coming up soon. So. I, you'll get the scoop from him, but OG Volta was doing additional production on it, and that and they made the note that we needed more trumpet, real trumpets on there. So that's when they brought me in for that. Um, but you know, I think that's it's just such an interesting situation every time because everyone works so differently. And I've had I've been in sessions where I make up all this crazy stuff, and then uh they take snippets and then they augment that and make it really crazy so i was working with dave hamlin for uh the 070 shake album uh which was released recently and i'm on two tracks on that and uh the way it operated with him was 
he, he had me just kind of go for it. And then he, he sent back specific notes. And then I never heard a final edit or even the whole song or even Shake's vocals until the song actually came out. And I was like, oh, that's, so that's what you did with it, you know? And uh, I loved what he ended up, you know, changing and adding all these crazy reverb effects and everything else on it. And so that's part of the excitement. And I'm not the type of person that goes, oh, you did that. Oh, you didn't seek my approval. Like, you got to just roll with the punches. And, uh, you know, it's just such a joy to be a part of it and to be on these things uh, in the first place. So flexibility and, and just being of service to the producers or the directors, whoever it is that you're working with is like of utmost importance, really. Sure. You mentioned Lil Nas X. Seeing industry baby just become this juggernaut and just rack up um, certifications and streams. Um, how does that, what, what is that like for you when, when you get notified that it's, what well, I think it's up to almost one and a half billion streams on Spotify now. Can you even um, register what that means? Yeah, I'm not really. I mean, the thing is I've been part of campaigns like La La Land on, on the behind the scenes side, but I've always wanted to have my sound on trumpet be heard in a mass level. And that was the song that did it. And uh, you kind of see all the marketing techniques that he used to do it. Like um, he made this Nike shoe and he put a droplet of his blood in it. And then Nike sent him a cease and desist letter. And then he's like, oh my goodness, my court date's coming up. I'm so scared guys. And what he ended up doing was that was really the intro to his music video that he used as a marketing tool and he said today's court day guys help wish me luck and then he dropped the industry baby music video and it it creates these little moments where then that gets shared a ton and everyone's talking about it. and the music video was like outrageously just all over the place uh, so fun to watch as well and then you have jack harlow touring and he's playing the song a ton at all of his dates. And then you get all these advertisers like Major League Baseball and then Sour Patch Kids used it and as they synced it and for one of their commercials. And it was kind of like the hype up anthem for the NBA playoffs and all these other things. So it just organically starts to spiral. And luckily the driver for that song really is, is the horn line. And so to say that I'm a part of it and then if anyone ever hears, oh yeah, you know what industry baby, oh I played the trumpet, then it, it, it builds credibility, which is what you always look for as a player and what I've always wanted to be a part of because I don't have to then send my demo reel or say, hi, I'm Ryan, I'm a trumpet player. It's like, you know, right. you get a little, as they call it, respect behind your name and it leads to just more opportunities, which is what you always hope for as a player. So I was really, really fortunate to be a part of that. And, and be a part of that wave and it and it continues like I think it just became six time platinum now and not to go back to Jaxta but I want everyone to know who's watching it's so cool because now I have a little placard that's made that you could share socially every time it gets another platinum recognition and it gets updated on Jaxta which is just really cool as well because you hoped that the RIAA would, you know, show that or it would be recognized by somewhere, but it's, it's, you know, sometimes overlooked or not really personalized in the way that it can be on your guys's platform. Well, I'm sure there'll be many more platinum certifications to come. So yeah. keep, keep a watch out. <laughs> what, Diamond's what, 10 times platinum? So I think so. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, that would be ridiculous. Um, but, you know, one of the things that happened because of the industry baby was um, I was always posting about it and I was already friends with this guy, Angel Lopez, who produced all of Jack Carlo's new album. And he hit me up and he said, hey, can you add horns to this beat? And I did, I didn't know it didn't have Jack on it or anything. And then it ended up being um, uh, the, the, his lead single from his new album nail tech and that has a similar repeating horn line that plays throughout as well so just little things like that you know it's important to share your your accomplishments and share your work because you never know who's watching and who could reach out and say hey i actually need horns for this absolutely but still for all that success you're still very much focused and driven on your supervising career as well you still want that i guess behind the scenes role uh, um yeah, that's my main profession. And uh, that is, you know, 
what really fuels my passion for the industry. The Trump is just more of a supplementary, fun, creative outlet. And that's another reason why I pivoted away from it. I, I was looking at my horn when I was in a practice room and I was thinking, this is going to have to equate to money. And that takes the fun out of it. You know, I, it takes the fun out of it for professional athletes too. When they're, when it, you know, if it switches from, I'm doing this for the passion for the game to I'm doing this to feed my family. And when it's kind of a, a, a difficult thing when those things intertwine. And so I always wanted to keep it light and fun as opposed to, you know, this note's going to cost $15. <laughs> Give me <laughs> Great way to look at it. And I think that's something that probably a lot of musicians struggle with is, you know, it's that, that process of really hustling to get to a point where they can make it a career. And then all of a sudden it is a career and, and there are some downsides to that in terms of pressures and, and it's not always fun, even though it's clearly a great career. Um, you know, it, it does, there's a professional element to it, which perhaps was not part of the thinking when they first started and were really enjoying what they were doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and on the sync side, you hear about that all the time where an artist will be offered a million dollars to have their song associated with a, a commercial or a brand and they'll say no. And, and people are perplexed and say, why don't you take the million dollars? And it's like, well, it's their artistic ability and freedom and image that maybe they don't want to be paired with a Toyota commercial or maybe they don't want to be part of the new eHarmony campaign, you know? And a lot of times people mistake hearing a song with a product as that artist's endorsement for it. So you really have to be careful on, in terms of what, what you lend your songs out to. Mm -hmm. So in terms of your path into music supervising, when you think back to studying at UCLA and then coming out of that and applying for internships at various organizations, I think I read an interview with you where you said, an inter interview with you when you said, the TV show Entourage kind of played a role in, in helping you think about what, what you like to get into. How is that the case? Oh, well, Entourage is amazing because it really shows all the different layers of how a team works together. You have Ari Gold, who is the agent for Vince, and then you have Vince, who's the star, and then you have E, who's kind of like a, a executive assistant at a high level for Vince, and then you have... Um, uh, what's the other guy who is his actual manager? Anyway, uh, I'm forgetting. I'm blanking on his name. I haven't seen the series in a while, but it's it's all very exciting, and it's um, it's it's how how the industry works and how everything's intertwined. And then the huge aspect of that entourage is with Ari and what happens at the talent agency, and that's how I first saw an inner glimpse of a talent agency. You see everyone's wearing suits, everything's uh, a little chaotic, but it's all very fast paced and exciting. And I was always reading people's resumes and trajectories and a lot of them start in the mail room. And so that I thought would be a very good um, <clears throat> uh, format for me to start at in the industry because you start answering people's phones. Uh, you immediately are paired with an agent who probably reps a bunch of clients. So you actually start to build credibility and work with these high profile clients and you're with everyone else. And only 2% of people who enter a mail room end up becoming an agent. So everyone disperses and joins companies like ABC or they go to HBO or they go to Netflix afterwards. And so you get immediately get a network. And it's kind of like when you join a fraternity at, in college you're you're part of something so that you have some support you have friends instantly and you could network better and so agencies are really really good at that and that's why they're very very competitive to join and to be a part of and um, luckily i became my first real job out of college was as a, an assistant at united talent agency yeah and so what did that entail was that basic tasks like even in the mail room or what did you have to do yeah well the music department was really small at united talent agency at the time we only had two agents and they repped uh celine dion bob seeger hall and oates uh and he also did the routing of the tours for jerry seinfeld and so what i was learning a lot of was looking at these contracts what guarantees artists would get at certain shows and routing their tours from the East Coast to the West Coast, 
would be done by the agent, but we would interface with the promoters to make sure they have all the right marketing materials to see what their ticket counts were. Why are the ticket counts low? What could we do to increase them? Because you don't want to miss out on any monies and you don't want your artist to play for an empty room either. So, um, you know, it, it was an amazing experience. I learned so much. Uh, and I ultimately learned that routing, being a, a music agent wasn't for me. I didn't want to book tours. Uh, it could be, it's, you can be creative on that end, but now talent agencies have grown so much from that. They include marketing, promotions, publicity, digital advertising, um, ventures like, um, you know, NFTs, games, all this other stuff that uh, so it's, it's really, really grown a ton, but, um, again, if I hadn't, I've gone towards that or realized and been a part of it, I wouldn't have, I might still be in it or thinking right. I could have. So I, I was there for a little over a year, uh, at, at UTA. Right. And was that not wanting to be that realization about not wanting to be, um, like a, a tour agent, was that what then pushed you towards Azov? um azov music and live nation for, for management well, it was a combination of that and also getting fired so uh <laughs> i always i'm very transparent about my you know career path and i like to tell people when i about getting fired because a lot of times they don't even think that's possible but like when you join these corporate juggernauts um they you you could be replaced at any time and you're an employee at will in california so you're not necessarily under contract and um assistants would get replaced so frequently that they wouldn't even give you a real email address usually it's your last name at the company but it was just generic music department assistant at united town agency and um that's because the turnover rate's so high they don't IT department would have to be making a new email address every couple months to a year. It's like, just keep it a solid email address. So you learn little things like that. And that um, my boss and I just, there was something a little off and I tried to remedy it. And then one day I get a call from HR and they're like, come down to the office. And then you say, you know, they're saying we're letting you go. And then you have uh, 20 minutes to pack up a banker box and the security's there and then they escort you out because they don't want you tampering with anything. So it's, uh, it's tough because no one prepares you for that. You know, there's, you, you think that you're going to be at a company for years and leave on your own terms, but you don't always get that opportunity. And so I learned that very early on. And if anything, it fueled me to outperform and, to uh not stick it back to them but to be like no you made the wrong decision like i'm going to shine and i just haven't found that opportunity yet so i used it more as, as a springboard to the next position which was at azov which is uh where i originally interned so everyone knew me they were happy i was coming back and it was a really great way to rebound because it's like i went from being at an agency to joining the most powerful and best music management company in in the world. So it was a it was a good move. And oh, sorry, go on. It was also important to not burn any bridges from my internship because they they welcomed me back with open arms. Yeah, that's incredible. Do you think all that experience which you gained um, at United Talent Ag Agency and at um, Azov Music and then moving into Lionsgate, there's all that sort of um, does it work in tandem with your musical career as well? You mentioned earlier that even though they're not completely related, there are certain parallels which help each other. But just that behind the scenes knowledge of even the fact that, you know, your job could be ended any minute um, and seeing things like routing and um, artist guarantees, has all that helped inform the way you act both as a music supervisor, but also as an artist? Oh, a thousand percent. And I think that's the true advantage I have over other maybe executives who didn't have to struggle as hard as a musician because that, that human element is always there for me and expected timelines and fair compensation and other things are are all matters that I, I was able to take into consideration and, and experience firsthand. So um, the the artistic vision gets lost so much and it really gets lost at the lawyer stage when 
the business affairs team is coming in and starting because they the empathy isn't there as much and the stringency and it's like why are we even doing this if the artists can't art and do what they need to do and and have their vision come to life and so um just having that compassion and understanding uh i think has helped me tremendously but also being in scoring sessions and being able to follow around along with the sheet music and knowing realistically um, what could be achieved and what not musically, knowing the different ranges of different instruments and um, capabilities is also really important because people think that musicians are magicians often, but that's not always the case. There's limits and there's, you have to be reasonable as well. So it's, it's definitely helped in the long run to start off as a musician at least. Yeah, nice. Ryan, you've been so generous with your time. We'll almost, almost finish up. Then, so thank you for your time. Is there, is there one song, whether, yeah, is, is there a recent song that you've heard and it's had a horn part on it that you've just been instantly jealous of the fact that you didn't get to do it or it changed the way you thought about horn parts in popular music? Is, is there a song which sort of springs to mind? Yeah, well, there's a couple. One is Doja Cat's new song for the Elvis film uh, it's called Vegas. And then it uses light horns in there. I don't know who did them, but, uh, or if they're real. Um, but, you know, I was like, oh, that would have been cool. And then, of course, uh, Liz, I love everything Lizzo does. And she is a big use of horns. And Ricky Reed does all of her stuff. And I've really tried to get on his radar and DM him. Uh, I haven't had any luck with that yet, but um, you know, there's certain repeat artists who really value horns. And um, those are two of them that, you know, I'd love to, to work with. And then, um, you know, on my big bucket list is, uh, is Drake as well as The Weeknd to get some horns on some of their tracks. So, right. you know, uh, but that's like the fun thing about music and the possibilities and just waiting by uh, for, for the opportunity. Absolutely. And Dave Matthews, still a, a big goal? Yeah, well, the thing is, like, the funny part was you, I always try to think of how I can add value to something. And it's like, okay, they already have a trumpet player, but I was working with my college professor who uh, was sponsored by this uh, – wonderful bag maker called uh, Guard Bags. They make beautiful leather bags for trumpets. And so I was connected with the trumpet player, Rashawn Ross on Facebook. And I think he knew that I was working with Jens and I was connected, uh, who's my professor and working with him. And then he called me one day and he's like, hey, I'd love to get one of those bags. And, and I hooked him up with one of them. So that was great. And so, uh, like we spoke and I was able to tell him like how awesome he is. And um, the ultimate, I think, cool thing would be is if I could guest and play a solo with them one day, you know, that's like, but that's like, again, that's the ultimate. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that would be awesome because I certainly um, uh, would love to improvise with them one day. But um, again, it's like forming a relationship uh, at least now I'm on his radar. You never know. He could be like, well, you know, I want to come out or what? Who knows? I don't know. But I think I need to get a couple more credits under my name first before I'm at like that level, you know? I think it'll happen. I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to manifest it to happen. Thank you. We could say it started here at JAXTA. Ryan, thanks so much for your time. It's been so great talking to you about um, everything, all incredible experience. And, and thank you for passing on all your knowledge and all your wisdom as well. Really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much, Rod. And uh, thank you to Ben as well uh, at JAXTA for always supporting. You guys are awesome. And uh, if anyone's watching and they don't have an account, make sure to make one because it's super beneficial just for displaying your achievements, which musicians often overlook and don't really do. So this will do it just for your, by yourself and, uh, always make sure your metadata is taken care of and you're credited properly. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank really you. appreciate it. Take care, mate. Have a great night.